try to cut off my dynamic. Are you doing this back and forth and about this and someone Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, easy peasy. I think All right. Oh, am I on? Can everyone hear me? Ah, here we are. Uh, welcome, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. My name is Alex Minami. I'm the Associate Director of Community Engagement here at Seattle Opera, and it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you all to our beautiful space here, the Opera Center. Before we get rolling in earnest here, I'd like to take a quick moment to acknowledge that we at Seattle Opera and our audiences are working, performing, and experiencing opera on the land of the Coast Salish peoples. Since time immemorial, the Coast Salish peoples have been stewards of this land and its waterways and continue to shape the Puget Sound region today. This acknowledgement does not take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous communities, and it is our collective responsibility to honor, preserve, and know the land we are on. Well, if I could beg your indulgence for a few more moments before I introduce our wonderful uh, guest speakers today. There are a number of people that I have to thank uh, who are responsible for bringing this um, event together. We're, first of all, very grateful for the generosity and support of the German Consulate General in San Francisco for making this event pos possible. In particular, we'd like to thank Deputy Consul General Elena Zims, who is responsible for fostering uh, the cultural ties between Germany and the Pacific Northwest. We're grateful for her support and advocacy, and she regrets that uh, she was un unable to be here this evening. Um, we'd also like to thank uh, our friends over at Goethe Pop-Up Seattle, who are here with us today. I think there they are in the middle. Um, uh, the Goethe Pop-Up Seattle, as you may know, uh, closed its doors this summer, um, but nevertheless, they were instrumental um, earlier on in this year uh, in laying the groundwork for tonight's event. Um, I'd also um, like to welcome to our space Rick Simonson of Elliott Bay Book Company, who was uh, kind enough, he's a longtime friend, of course, of Seattle Opera, and um, he very kindly organized the book signing that will follow uh, this evening's talk. Um, one last uh, little housekeeping announcement is that if you are a member of uh, our Bravo, club, we will be having a post-show discussion, a follow-up conversation across the street on Roy Street over at Solo Bar. So you're invited to join us for that, and we will be gathering in the lobby after the event uh, and walking over. Uh, the talk will be moderated by, or facilitated, I should say, by um, our uh, uh, Director of Programs and Partnerships, Dennis Robinson, Jr., and uh, I believe um, our speakers uh, may be joining us. Some of them flew in just uh, two days ago from South Africa, um, but um, uh, I believe our uh, speakers might be joining that as well. All right, um, enough of me. Let's learn more about uh, tonight's speakers. Uh, musicologist, writer, and opera lover Naomi Andre uh, has been appointed Seattle Opera's inaugural scholar in residence. You're now in your third season, or maybe it's fourth season, as our scholar-in-residence, uh, which is a great honor to us. She is the author of Black Opera, History, Power, Engagement, which the New York Times describes as a, quote, necessary exploration of how race has shaped the opera landscape in the United States and South Africa. Dr. Andre is the David G. Fry Distinguished Professor in the Department of Music at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill and was previously a professor in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies, Women's Studies, and the Residential College at the University of Michigan. She is a founder of the Black Opera Research Network. Thank you, Naomi, for being here. Uh, Kira Thurman is a highly sought after and award-winning historian and musicologist. She serves as Associate Professor of History, Associate Professor of German Studies, uh, and Associate Professor of Musicology at the University of Michigan, and she is the founder of the web website blackcentraleurope.com. A classically trained pianist who grew up in Vienna, Austria, her research focuses on two topics that occasionally converge, the relationship between music and national identity and Central Europe's historical and contemporary relationship with the black diaspora. 
Her book, Singing Like Germans, Black Musicians in the Land of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, traces the history of black classical musicians in German-speaking Europe across the 19th and 20th century. It has won several prizes and is continuing to win prizes and was named one of NPR's best books of 2021. Thank you so much, Kira, for being here. And, and with that, I will leave it to the both of you. Terrific, oh, great. I just want to thank you, Seattle, for showing up. It is a Thursday evening and everyone's so busy and we still are doing masks. So thank you so much for being here. I wanna thank Seattle Opera because it is such a joy to come here and talk about opera. I'm somebody who most people looking at me as a, oh, I don't know, middle-aged black woman. What are you doing in opera? And yet Seattle Opera is just so warm and embracing and asking really great questions about things. I also love this opportunity to be able to talk with somebody who I have admired for a long time, has watched going from sort of late graduate school into um, professional world, becoming a superstar. And I have left the University of Michigan, have moved to UNC Chapel Hill, and the hardest thing is not living just a few blocks away from people I think the world of. It is such an honor, and thank you, Seattle, for bringing her here and letting us have this conversation. So, a lot of fun things. You're hearing, and you know, usually I don't say so much um, that's so, oh, look at us, but mainly to, amplify my wonderful colleague, you've got two black women talking to you who've got PhDs and are professors talking to you about opera. And <laughs> it's kind of unusual and it's happening here at Seattle. So amazing, wonderful. Okay. We're basically going to, instead of having a full-blown, you know, who knows where it'll go conversation, working with Dr. Thurman, my dear friend Kira, she is just super organized and has all these PowerPoints and things to help us structure things. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to start, there'll be a little bit of really getting into her research and what is, does it mean to this, this very provocative title, Singing Like Germans and having black folks in Germany, sort of what does that mean? What does that mean for opera? How does it sort of provide a background? for Tristan Dunt Isolde, all of this stuff. We were gonna bring this together. What I think I would like to do before just getting into any sort of probing questions and stuff like that, is that I'm going to turn it over to you for a reading. I want you to know that we'll be talking, having a conversation, learning a whole lot about the book, but we're also going to be moving to uh, have a time for you to ask questions. So anything you've got a question about, just sort of make a little note, we will come back to it and I'm turning it over to you oh, thank sure. you no thank you and thank you so much Naomi for uh, your lovely remarks I miss you already in Ann Arbor I really did live around the block from her place I would jog by it while uh, you know in the morning sometimes um, so uh, yes I think without and also I should say thank you to Seattle Opera it's been so lovely being here it's really been such a joy I'm already tr like trying to figure out how to ask how I can come back and when I can come back <laughs> Right, because I just loved it so much. Um, so what I'm going to do is read the introduction of my um, book. I foolishly forgot my copy at home, um, but as you can see over here, you can by all means buy a copy of your own to take with you, as well as of Naomi's two different books. Um, so, but what I'm going to do first is read the introduction, just read a little bit of the introduction to get us started so that you can understand what I work on, which is the history of black musicians going to Germany and Austria in the 19th and 20th centuries. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, just making sure. Okay, well then here we go. I think this reading will take about maybe five to 10 minutes is my plan. Um, so just so you're aware of the time for it. Okay, so this is the introduction, line one, all of that. Grace Bumbry glittered in gold. 
the African-American soprano glided around the set of the Bayreuth Festival Theater, shimmering under a dim glow of light filtered through laced netting that flooded the stage in gentle waves. Playing the role of Venus in the 19th century German composer Richard Wagner's 1845 opera Tannhäuser, Bambri sparkled with each turn, embodying the tempting seductress she had been cast to perform, singing of love and lust to an enraptured audience of nearly 2,000 listeners, including international dignitaries, high-ranking classical musicians, music critics, and socialites. Built between 1872 and 1876, the Bayreuth Festival Theater, where Bunbury sang, was a national monument of sorts, a shrine to the works of Wagner, and every summer pilgrims flocked to the small Bavarian town to hear Wagner's operas performed in the house that he had built. But in the summer of 1961, news that Wagner's grandson, Wieland Wagner, had hired a young black soprano to sing inside Bayreuth's hallowed halls sent shockwaves across West Germany. Prior to her performance that warm evening, that warm July evening, hundreds of letters of protest had bombarded the opera house, declaring that Bunbury's presence in Bayreuth would have that most quote unquote German of composers rolling over in his grave. Bunbury ignored them all. And on the first night of her appearance, the aspiring diva received a 30-minute standing ovation. Her performance earned her international accolades and vaulted her to stardom. Bumbry's Bayreuth debut brings to light many different themes in German history that were hiding in plain sight. First, it illustrates how German audiences' understandings of classical music, long heralded as the most German of the arts, could shift depending on the political era. No composer better symbolized how swiftly listeners could change their positions on music than Richard Wagner himself, an ardent anti-Semite and German nationalist, whose music Adolf Hitler later publicly avowed and generously supported. After World War II, however, Wagner's operas came under close scrutiny by Allied forces because of the composer's perceived proximity to Nazism. And many performances of his operas were either banned outright during the early occupation years or strongly discouraged. To bring Wagner back from the dead, the Bayreuth Festival Theater embarked on a rescue mission. The music of Wagner could survive the administrators believed, if given a new set of tools with which to perform and listen to it. One such tool was Grace Bumbry, a soprano with absolutely no experience singing Wagner. The administration's insistence on hiring her anyway and the public's vociferous response to her debut illuminates another important theme in German history. Namely, how cultural institutions wrestled with questions of race and racism. Bayreuth's reclamation of Wagner through a black singer was not only a bold act of rehabilitation, but also an intentional insistence on rejecting the kind of racist audiences who extolled the noxious ideologies that Wagner had espoused. Out of the ashes of Nazism, they proclaimed, West Germany had risen like a phoenix to become a democratic society. And Bunbury's performance on Bayreuth's recently denazified stage was evidence of a new political era of racial acceptance. Her debut was meant to usher in a vibrant new moment in German history. The initiative was deeply flawed. In order to disengage from a previous racial order, Wagner and the opera production team ultimately turned to historical myths of deviant black female sexuality to transform Bunbury into an erotic goddess on stage. Called the Black Venus in newspapers and in casual conversation, Grace Bunbury quickly came to symbolize earlier representations of sexualized black women in European history, from Sarah Bartman to Josephine Baker. 
Bayreuth's 1961 production illustrates the problems and paradoxes of dislodging a cultural institution from its racist past by relying on historical stereotypes of black people to do it. But even while Bunbury sang in scandalous dress and smeared in glitter, her symbolic significance as the vanguard of a new era could not be shaken. To see Bunbury as representing a new era in German history, however, misses a greater story. Her premiere takes on new meaning when we treat it not as the beginning of something new, but rather the product of almost 100 years of black networking and transatlantic activity. Since at least the 1870s, African-American classical musicians were involved in the production and dissemination of classical music on German soil. Other black musicians, such as Sissy Retta Jones, an opera singer who performed in 1890s Berlin, and the contralto Marian Anderson, who lived and performed in the 1930s Germany and Austria, these different singers made Bunbury's path to stardom a little more feasible. The fact that audiences persistently viewed Bunbury's debut as a novelty also occludes the most telling fact. Bunbury was not the first black singer to grace the Bayreuth stage. In fact, the Afro-European contralto Lorana Aldridge had been invited by the Wagner family to reside with them in Bayreuth in the 1890s. Welcomed into the arms of Cosima Wagner and her daughters, Lorana Aldridge was supposed to perform as a Valkyrie in Wagner's ring cycle before falling ill in 1896. Bunbury's debut then takes on greater meaning if we understand it as one of many black performances that caused a listening public to work out the ties between music, race, and nation. Performances like Bunbury's were especially powerful because they challenged the deeply entrenched notion in German history that blackness and Germanness were discrete categories. Angry protesters against Grace Bunbury's debut argued that a black musician performing Wagner was paradoxical in nature, thus reinforcing the notion that Germanness was synonymous with whiteness and that black people existed outside of it. Bunbury's insistence on singing Wagner rejected the sonic and racial boundaries that white German audiences had constructed. Bunbury's debut is important because it placed a black musician at the center of a national debate. But her premiere wasn't the only time a black musician had been called upon to perform this important cultural labor. Using documents that I collected from over 30 archives in Germany, Austria, and the United States, this is also why I'm tired, <laughs> this book traces the long history of black classical musicians, both singers and instrumentalists from the Americas, the Caribbean, and from, of course, within Europe, who studied and performed in Germany and Austria, the musical heartland of Europe. It narrates a story across the 19th and 20th centuries, beginning in the 1870s, after the abolition of slavery in the United States and German unification, which happens in 1871. And it ends in the early 1960s with the construction of the Berlin Wall in 1961, one month after Grace Bunbury's debut. It follows black musicians through every political era in modern Germany and Austria, starting with Imperial Germany and Austria, the vibrant and volatile 1920s and 30s, the rise of Nazism, the creation of three political states after 1945. You get Austria, the West Germany, and East Germany. What my book demonstrates is that by virtue of what they performed, where they performed, and how they performed it, Black classical musicians consistently challenged their audience's ideas of blackness, whiteness, and German national identity. White German and Austrian listeners frequently assumed that the categories of blackness and Germanness were mutually exclusive. Yet black performances of German music suggested that these topologies were not as fixed as listeners had been conditioned to expect. Audiences, I demonstrate, 
oscillated between seeing black classical musicians as rightful heirs and dangerous usurpers of Austro-German musical culture. I'm going to leave it there for now. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for giving us this sort of overview. And I love how the beginning of your book, just in terms of a structural way, sort of gives us an immediate sort of big moment, a moment that a lot of people in opera, and for those who, who know, and for those who don't know, Grace Bumbry's performance at Bayreuth was a big event because it was happening in 1961 when black folks were not really singing on opera stages that much. We have the, or at least we think they weren't. And I think a lot of our work, you looking in Germany, me looking at a lot in the United States, there's really this history of having black folks pop up <laughs> in, in opera from different singers to different composers going back into the 19th century here in the US. I'm act that's actually part of the project I'm working on. But also, we have these big signal moments. Marian Anderson singing at the Metropolitan Opera in 1955. And then here, just a few years later in 61, Bunbury singing as Die Schwarze Venus, as she was called, the Black Venus in Bayreuth. Marian Anderson was singing, interestingly, as Ulrika in Verdi's Balu and Mascara, which is a sort of medium who, uh, a witch, somebody who connects with the other worlds. So these exoticized roles within the mainstream repertory, really interesting things. You, I know, have some great PowerPoints, and I really love that also came out in this opening bit. Um, the opening section, how you've structured and organized the book, where you have these different historical periods um, where it's so important, I mean, it's really beautifully done, how you've got moments of German national identity from 1870 with the war, so the Franco-Prussian War and Germany, modern Germany becoming what it is under Bismarck, to just years, a few years after the um, Civil War here in the United States when we're in the thick of Reconstruction and sort of there's a new chance for black folks in the United States as free folks to be in Congress, be in the Senate, having black mayors, black incorporated towns such as Eatonville, Florida, where Zora Neale Hurston was from. Um, you also have, so these just beautiful moments, 18, part two with 1918 to 45, you've got sort of after World War I and Germany is going through both a very difficult time, but also an incredible flowering with the Weimar Republic and um, you have the Harlem Renaissance is happening here. Um, you then have part three where it's after World War II and we've got the very beginnings of the civil rights movement here in the United States and also as Germany is repartitioned. So I just love how you weave in this history and this larger issue of Afro-German and what that means. I know that you... Um, are sort of thinking about, or when we think of blackness in the United States and musicians here and black folks performing in Europe and the space that Europe provides for black folks, whether it's in jazz, whether it's James Baldwin and Langston Hughes, writers, and what it means for musicians who are singing classical music. Can you talk about that a little? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so I'm definitely gonna talk about it and I will also do another reading. Um, let me see if I can grab that really quickly. Um, yeah, that, you know, so the way that my book works, which does look extensive, but I promise it's readable. I promise it's not entirely entirely, you know, boring. Um, but uh, NPR liked it, that's the other thing. That's right, it was like an NPR best book of the year or whatever. So, um, but uh, the way that it works is you can kind of see as I start off first in the United States and then kind of follow musicians across the ocean to Germany and Austria, kind of bopping back and forth, um, you know, throughout the rest of the chapters, but taking seriously um, how Germans are also understanding them, how German culture is understanding them, because I am, at the end of the day, a German historian. Um, you know, and so, uh, and so, again, so in terms of structure, this was the thing that was really 
um, fun about my book, but also exhausting and why I want to nap, is because you know I, I was really insistent and adamant about taking a long time period, about 100 years, which um, for German historians, they're like, what are you doing? That's, you know, that's too much. Um, you know, a but really busy time period in German history. I know, right? It's not like, yes, it's, it's not like nothing happened in the 20th century in Germany. <laughs> right, so um, it's, yes, but that I was convinced that there was a larger story to show here of how, um, in other words, particularly African-American musicians kept coming back to Germany and so and realizing that they would come they would tell other generations they would tell their friends they would tell teachers they would tell their students you know and more would just keep going to Germany and Austria to perform you know and Shirley Verrett actually said it the famous uh, African American singer um, you know that that she felt like it was really necessary this is the case for a lot of Americans regardless of race I should say as well that it was necessary to go to Europe first right to perform and to train and so Shirley Verrett was like go to Germany, like this was sort of her, her thing. Um, so what I'm going to do next is read an excerpt um, also from the introduction that gets to this question of black motivations for going to Germany and Austria to perform in different opera houses. You know, um, and I should say, I mean, of course, the thing about Germany and Austria too is just like from Shirley Vera's perspective really quickly, the sheer number of opera houses that you could um, study at, train at, you know, um, you know, do a young artist program, et cetera, et cetera, was always really exciting and a really a benefit over 80, you know, um, and that uh, there's a book by a friend of mine named Emily Richmond Pollock looking at, for example, a tiny scandal, like an opera scandal um, at an opera house in Mainz, which is a small Western Germany, like Western, Western German uh, town. Um, <laughs> And the headline, this is from the 1950s after World War II with this opera scandal. And I still, I love this so much. The headline is like, finally, a real opera scandal in Mainz, right? And so, you know, because, right, that like, it just, you know, so there's a way that, that they were like, we made it to the big leagues if we too have our own opera scandal. Um, so, but this is just to show just like the proliferation of opera houses in, in uh, Germany in particular. Um, but nonetheless, what I'm going to read now is a passage about, um, black motivations for going to Germany and Austria um, in the 19th and 20th century. So here we go. Oh, and the passage is called uh, Beethoven Goes Global, Musical Universalism and Black Migration. So, when asked by an American journalist in 1897 if there was a difference in her reception between American and European audiences, the black opera si uh, singer Sissy Retta Jones responded, yes, a marked difference. In Europe, there is no prejudice against my race. It matters not to them in what garb an artist come, so he be an artist. It is the artist's soul they look at there, not the color of his skin. About a decade later, the African-American violinist and recent transplant to Europe, Clarence Cameron White, made the same argument in an interview with the African-American newspaper, The New York Age. Quote, on every side, you find that the European musician and music lover uh, as well realizes that music is too broad and too universal to be circumscribed by the complexion of the skin or texture of the hair. Both performers turn to powerful notions of classical music's universality and to myths of European colorblindness to explain why they believed black classical musicians were better received in Europe than in the United States. Their reasons for doing so were not rooted entirely in praise of European culture. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, black classical musicians expressed their righteous anger and frustration with the American classical music market, which used extreme measures to exclude them. While many had trained at conservatories of music, such as Oberlin College or the New England Conservatory of Music since the late 19th century, once they stepped off the podium, of graduation, they encountered constant institutional barriers to their success. 
Although Mar Americans now laud Marian Anderson for breaking the racial barrier at the Metropolitan Opera House in 1954, which is what Naomi just said. Countless black musicians had been available to sing prior to her, de prior to her debut. And where were they to perform? Take, for instance, an incident in 1925 when the Italian opera singer Eduardo Ferrari Fontana staged a competition at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City to find a black woman to sing Verdi's Aida, an opera about an Ethiopian princess who must choose between the Egyptian general Rodimus, her father's enemy, and her loyalty to Ethiopia. The tenor Ferrari Fontana confessed, quote, it has always been a mystery to me why empresarios have not sought a Negro voice for an opera like Aida. Much to the shock and later horror of the Metropolitan Opera House, over 250 women responded to Ferrari Fontana's request for black singers, all stating that they were ready for the part. And many of them were. Classically trained singers such as Muriel Ron, who in 1959 became the first black musical director of what is now the Frankfurt Opera, Florence Cole Talbert, the first black woman to perform Verdi's Aida in Europe, they were both shortlisted. Yet despite the overwhelming proliferation of letters and telegrams seeking an audition, the Metropolitan Opera House shut down this vocal experiment. Spurned by classical music institutions in the United States, by the late 19th century, African-American musicians began to argue that Europe was a place of racial acceptance for their musical gifts. Black praise of Europe, however, frequently had less to do with European racial attitudes than with African-American dissatisfaction with life in the United States. Nonetheless, black musicians claimed that while classical music in the United States operated along rigid racial fault lines, in Europe, classical music was simply too universal to be debased by racism. European support for their performances, they said, was proof that musical universalism was transcendent. I think I'm going to stop it there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. As you can get a sense of the rhythm and the flavor, the lyricism with which you bring all this history, thanks. It tells such a great story. I mean, I can't believe it. There was a competition, 1925, where the Metropolitan Opera said, hey, we want a call to have a black Aida. 250 applied, and then they're like, whoa, <laughs> let's shut this down. Oh, so it's recovering this type of history, which is so beautifully done in, in your work, and I'm just, so excited. I, I hate to say this, but it's like, I can't wait for the next stuff, because I don't want to put any more pressure know, on I'm you tired. whenever that, that pops up. So we have this issue of sort of what is at stake for Germanness when black people are singing the music that, and you've got in there, you know, they close their eyes and sometimes they can sort of, they, they forget the person is black, having the music come through. This transcendence, the universalism you were just talking about. And then what is at stake for black folks who might come from the United States, but then to sing in Europe, and it's not as though it's a, as you're saying, a free space where everybody could um, you know, live in perfect harmony, but where people were al allowed to have careers. And we see this with yeah. people still today. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. I mean, this is a hard thing to, you know, um, to hold. I, I try to hold two things, that two things can be true at once, even if they are or feel contradictory. One being that for so many African American uh, classical musicians, sopranos, etc., you know that Europe really did feel like this land of freedom. You know um, that Cicerita Jones, this African American opera singer in 1895, was like, "Hey, I can stay in any hotel I want." Right, I can drink from any drinking fountain I want. Like, there's just the lack of a, of a certain kind of Jim Crow, like there, that makes Europe so exciting and exhilarating. You know, and Germany in particular as like the land of Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, which is the title of the book. You know, so so on the one hand, I want to hold space for that, while at the same time, I'm still interested in how nonetheless they're being exoticized on stage and how Germans have their own, you know, um, tradition of 
kind of pushing out uh, people of color and black people in particular from their musical worlds and from national, I mean, in particular national identity, which is the thing that I'm interested in as a German historian, not only a musicologist. I, that leads us to another topic, but I want to make sure we get through the stuff you wanted to present. Are there a few I, like slides? Other, like I'm trying to think, like other slides or other things like that? And actually, let me look at my, let, let me look at my PowerPoint as well. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm trying to think of, um, ba, 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 ba. <laughs> I'm like looking really quickly. Because the big question I want to get to is this, how you are uniquely positioned to be asking these questions. Right. And so, Yes. Sure. So we can hold off on that for one sec. Sure. I think, you know, maybe what I would argue, let me go back really quickly, is here we go. You know, so the thing that I, is so interesting to me, thinking about German music, which I adore and love and again grew up on growing up in Vienna, Austria. As a pianist, I'm not a singer. I apologize, everybody. Um, you know, but the thing I find so interesting and what's so fascinating about what happens here is there's this language of musical universalism that music is a, is a universal language. And then my joke is, okay, if it's a musical language, it has, like if music is a universal language, it has a very strong German accent, right? Like there's a way that we see German composers dominating, certainly in the 19th century, um, you know, classical music worlds in particular, um, and, and the idea of who is the most universal, so to speak. Um, so, and you know, so, so much so that the joke is in the 19th century, there's an American journalist who says it by the late 19th century, that there are two types of music, German music and bad music, right? I mean, that's sort of the joke, right? I mean, I don't, we're not ascribing to it, but we're nonetheless, we're pointing it out. You know, and so the thing that is so interesting and fascinating, what happens and what I'm pointing out in a lot of ways, and when I have, um, as an example, this is a Schumann quote, right, um, that also gets at this, the, the sort of universality, um, not only of German music, but also like how uh, this is a gift that German speakers in particular have to offer the world, is, is sort of uh, their music, German music, is the most universal. Again, the irony and the paradox here of, of like claiming this music is universal and using that for, your, for the senses of, for the purposes of nationalism. You know, and so, but the thing that's so fascinating and so, um, what I love so much, the irony here is that because this music is considered universal, we have African Americans in the 19th century start to claim it. And they're like, well, if this music is universal, then it belongs to me too. And German audiences are not expecting that, right? There, there's a way that they are expecting the music to perhaps travel around the world, but they don't expect it to then come back to them and to be interpreted so expertly by different African-American performers. So that's the shock. It's, it's you know, and so there's this really fascinating, um, at least for me, tension that I'm looking at and I'm exploring in my book between German claims to sort of musical universalism and then what happens when people of color begin to also start preaching that gospel of musical universalism. Well, if that it makes gets sense. to the heart of what is transcendent and universal yeah. because if it's out there for everyone, right. for every person, every human, then right. when you have black folks who are claiming it, right. it sort of implies there is an equal hum humanity allowed right. to folks when you wouldn't really expect, oh, wow, we have black folks who can do jazz, but they can also do this other universal language of Bach, Beethoven, right. Brahms. Right, 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 right. So it's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, thanks. And so maybe to get to the question, if we're talking about like the, you know, if we've been talking so far about African-American motivations for going over, how they are taking up this music, really believing in it. And let me see, I think I have, um, for example, of an image of that. I've got a couple different, let me see. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Da -da 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 -da. Right, so this is perhaps an example of this. I spent a lot of time in the summer of 2015 living in my parents' basement in Atlanta, which they loved, and um, going to different archives at different HBCUs to look at how they started their music programs to see like how overwhelmingly uh, German in a lot of ways their repertoire was, the foundations of their conservatories of music were. So this is, for example, Fisk University, um, which by 1891, no, 1881 had the Mozart Society, which you see here, which was a choir uh, formed to perform large choral orchestral 
works. They did Mendelssohn's Elijah. They would do Brahms' Requiem and the like, you know, and they had an orchestra as well. Um, you know, so I, so I spent all of this time seeing really, again, like how German music really reached um, everybody and how they took the music on for themselves, right, and for their own purposes, which we could get into um, as, as well. And so um, I think I'm bringing this up first so we can think about like African-American motivation for going, how they had consumed this music for themselves, but then the question does become like how do Germans understand them? I love this picture because, you know, it's wonderful to go into the archives, such the bread and butter of historians, but also from 1938 that this is Fisk University and how you can see it's, first of all, they have a Mozart society and that German music is a really big part of the curriculum, part of respectability and all of this sort of going into it, but also the makeup of the of this society because, and it shows that Fisk is, when we think of historically black colleges and universities, they've always had an element of yeah. sort of an integrated student oh, body yeah. a little oh, yeah. bit. Yeah. You know, over right there, I mean, this is, it was so fascinating and so much fun to spend time in, in HBCUs that summer, you know, with my parents and my dog, you know, and to, to look around and to think about how there were all of these attempts, not only attempts, successful attempts, I would say, to establish conservatories of music at historically black colleges. If they couldn't get into, you know, uh, a lot of white institutions, and then they were going to found their own, right? Wow. Which is very much what Fisk University did, Howard University did, Spelman College, places like that. They had their own musical traditions that they were developing. This is something I'm, oh, unfortunately, with my eye oh, on time, yes, okay. and I want us to okay, sorry. Yes. all, no, 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 that's okay. I want us to be able to talk a little bit more and then to get questions that people have. I had mentioned that you are uniquely positioned to do this right. in terms of being somebody who understands American culture, African American culture, and then German culture, yeah. and then to bring and be a musician. Right. And I, you've sort of dropped little bits of this throughout, but I just want to sort of amplify this. If somebody were to look at you and see you, you know, perfectly adapted and talking about things uh -huh. here in the US, people would just normally yeah. think you grew up here yeah. and this is you know, your world. Right. But, and then you sort of, I don't know, went on a German Goethe Institute, um, <laughs> DAAD <laughs> fellowship, which are right. amazing and wonderful. But yeah. that actually wasn't your journey. For, no, 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 yeah, I'm kind of on them. That's German. Um, right, so, uh, which is to say I grew up in Vienna, Austria. There have been four generations of my family in German-speaking Europe. I have tiny nieces who speak terrible English, whose first language is German. And that, and that when I think about my research, you know, what I was interested in doing was not only capturing the African-American side of going over there, but really thinking critically about how German audiences, predominantly white German audiences, are understanding them. You know, and that the reason why I'm doing this is because as a German historian, you know, I am committed to talking about a longer history of German anti-black racism, that we've gotten good at talking about anti-Semitism for obvious reasons which are right. necessary, you know, but that it's also now time to get better at including anti-black racism into this conversation. You know, and so, um, you know, so examples or statistics that I give, if it's helpful, um, is that there are over one million black people in Germany who identify as German today. Um, which sounds small, it's about, it's over 1% of the population. And that sounds small, but what's also helpful to remember is that it's the same percentage as the percentage of Jews in Germany in 1933 when Adolf Hitler comes to power, wow. right? So in other words, it's not just or only about size or numbers, it's about, it's about representation, it's about visibility, it's about what these numbers somehow come to represent or mean in German culture and society. And that, and actually, I can show an image that gets at this, you know, this was very much much my, I'm really going to go all over the place, you know, this was very much my experience growing up um, in, in Vienna is this t-shirt that this one black artist made um, in Berlin. He would wear these on the street. This was like his avant-garde art project in 2016, you know, of like, of how black people in Germany are constantly asked, like, and when do you go back? 
right? Oh, the assumption being that you, you cannot be from Germany, right? right? That you cannot be from there. So I call it the black German paradox, like this idea that somehow you cannot be black and German is an idea that has long-standing roots in German history going back to at least the 19th century. You know, and so, um, and that's something that I experienced growing up that I could not possibly, be, I could not possibly be German or Austrian. It's something that I'm worried about for my nieces growing up in Germany today. You know, and so the thing that was so fascinating, though, about my project was that, and I'm going to skip ahead. You know, is that for. Um, People like Marian Anderson and others, when they start performing German leader, when they start performing German opera, there's a way that they are really challenging, sometimes by accident, this idea that you can't be black and German, right? They're performing so well, their yeah. accents are flawless, right? Their diction is perfect, right? That it really causes oftentimes, frankly, German audiences to have meltdowns, that they can't, they don't know what to do with the fact that they have, you know, people performing and practicing Germanness, I guess, you know, which means then that it's like, it's not something that has to be inherited like biologically, but that anybody can do it becomes right. one of the revelations of like hearing Marian Anderson sing German leader so well, or Jesse Norman, right, singing right. opera. Which goes right back to your thought of this music is transcendent and a universal yeah. language. Yeah. So what does it mean when so many people get to? Yeah, it means just, meltdowns. It, it means it, people wow. have meltdowns. Yeah. Wow. Well, just to like pick up on something you mentioned, you said you're a fourth, you four generations yeah. of Germans in yeah. your family. Also, you have a connection to Tacoma, Washington. That's right, that's right, which is very random. It's true, so the reason why my family went over to Vienna in the first place is because my grandfather went to the University of Puget Sound, um, hooray, he studied uh, chemistry and became a nuclear chemist. Um, and then he worked for a nuclear power plant nearby. I feel really bad that I don't know what it's called. I think maybe Alex said Hanford anyway, something like that. And then it was a power plant where people constantly got poached by the United Nations and the International Atomic Energy Association or IAEA. Um, so my grandfather got poached in the late 60s. And so my dad went to, like my dad also went to the same school that I did in Vienna, which I, I grew up around the corner from my grandparents in Vienna. It's like a, yeah, it's a particular kind of story, I guess I would say. It, it really is. I've known you for yeah. many years now and I was just finding that out like, oh my gosh, you had yeah. multiple generations there. Yeah. You were born there. Right. You, wow, wow. Right. So you've used this term Afro-German yeah. uh, a few times. And can you just explain that? Because sure. here in the US, I think a lot of us were used to hyphenated Americans. Yeah. This idea that you can have African Americans, Chinese Americans, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Latin Amer well, that so sort of means a mm -hmm. different thing. But you know what I mean. Like mm -hmm. we're used to this concept of people coming to the United States and you can be American and you can be something else. I think that's why immigration issues are so it, like so um, tough because what does it mean to be an American? Mm -hmm. Afro-German, my sense is that these hyphenated identities are a little yeah. different, and particularly sure. when you bring blackness in. Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, you know, again, I think when I'm thinking about my book and the interventions that it's making or the things I want people to think about, you know, it's very much this question of like, can you be black and German? And that these op different opera singers and the like are constantly exposing that. They're constantly like sonically challenging the idea that like you can't, like, you can't be black and German. Um, oh, right, so the term Afro-German or, or uh, Afro-Deutsch, auf Deutsch, würde ich sagen, um, um, so that term uh, itself is a term that uh, starts in the 1980s in earnest by the black feminist Audre Lorde. Oh wait, who, she's the one who coined it? Afro yeah, well she helped to coin it. So this is the thing, right? So she she helped to start the Afro-German movement in the 1980s. Yeah. That's still the movement that we have today. It has different organizations like um, ISD, or Initiative Schwarze Deutsche, which is the initiative for black people in Germany, um, which is kind of like their NAACP or things like that, um, that gets started in the 1980s. They have like lawyers on retainer, et cetera, et cetera, um, try to pass bills in parliament, that kind of thing. Wow. Um, you know, and so she helps to start this in the 1980s in part because um, she is there to offer a seminar on feminism. Yeah. Uh, she herself was an American Caribbean, you know, feminist scholar and professor and poet, among other things. Um, and she's meeting all of these different black women in Germany yeah. um, 
And she's like, what? Well, number one, what's going on? And then, <laughs> and then number two, she was like, what do you all call yourselves? And they're like, what? And she's like, what do you call yourselves? And they were like, well, we only have, they only had negative terms that like German society would call them, like Mischlingskind, which is like mixed child, or like Besatzungskind, which is like occupation child. Anyway, oh, they had all oh. of these negative terms. And she says, no, there is power in naming yourself. Right, like what is a term that you can come up with for yourself, yeah. right? And that's how the term Afro Dutch or Afro German gets born, right? Um, yeah, there's something really powerful about that kind of experience in that moment. So yeah. even when you've got singers like Marian Anderson or other black singers, um, Shirley Barrett when she was there, Grace Bumbry, they didn't have this term, and so sort of naming it was, was helpful. Yeah. I didn't realize Aldra Lorde. And Lord. I should say, like, as Marian Anderson is coming over and performing, or as Shirley, Shirley Verrett or Gloria Davy or others are coming over and performing, they are meeting black Germans, you know, yeah. but there's just not the language or vocabulary per se yeah. yet to, to, to sort of think about, like, what is a collective kind of black German experience, if that makes sense. So I think that's really related to all that you're showing with musicians are one yeah. group of, of this world oh, of afro oh, I mean, So here's an example. Annabelle Bernard is a African-American soprano who becomes the first, like one of the first Americans to have a regular, a full contract at the Deutsche Oper, right, in Berlin in 1962, I think she gets it, oh, right? Wow. And so she is a mainstay staple of the Deutsche Oper for like decades, um, I think until like the late 80s, early 90s, I want to say, or something like that. But she's also very involved in the Afro-German movement which is really interesting right and yeah. I didn't know I didn't know that part yeah, until yeah. like another friend told me that so there yeah. are all of these really interesting connections that way what music is bringing together I think before we open it up to questions I want to oh, make yeah, just questions. one and so think of questions also if there's something final you want to say before we open it up but I really love this sort of coming full circle where Grace Bumbry, she opens her book and she's like a really important articulation of blackness on the German stage, how she was in, in her 20s, wasn't oh, she? Yeah, young, young. And she was, um, hadn't sung Wagner a whole lot before. Not a lick of Wagner. Yeah. And yet it was so important in terms of what it's done for German culture, American culture, black culture. We've got an interesting parallel situation here, a very experienced and nurtured by Seattle, Mary Elizabeth Williams, who probably would have been singing more German had the pandemic not interrupted a bunch of things. I know there were things on her calendar. But here she is, sort of nurtured, having sung a lot of the uh, Puccini, Verdi, Leonora's, um, uh, Maria Stuarda, sort of big, big lyrical Italian roles. And she, as far as I know, and I haven't looked through this entirely, um, like, but I've asked several people, I think she is the first black woman singing Isolde. And which is an amazing thing, Seattle. And you, yes, really, you have nurtured her. She's had one performance. She's got one tomorrow night and then two more. I think she's going to be singing this role um, in Paris. I think that's already scheduled. But oh my goodness, there's like a really important big moment happening here. And that Seattle is supporting it is wonderful. I d and, there's so many other cases, it's not, I mean, what makes the story so fun is that Seattle Opera doesn't just have one black singer or one Asian singer, but that peppered throughout, boy, that's really an unfortunate choice of words, <laughs> sorry, sort of sprinkled throughout <laughs> different casts. Yeah. yeah. You have singers of color, not just, I mean, it's great to have black folks, very love, love that, but you have a lot of different Asian singers, you've got Latino singers, Latina singers, it's just incredible what's happening here. Mm -hmm. So, are there questions? Sure. Oh, yes, we have one way okay. up at the top. Sure. Um, do we have a microphone? I think we do, and Alex is doing... Oh, okay, oh, Alex is going to bring a microphone, microphone around, which is helpful, hopefully, for uh, everybody. So, body. yeah, do you see him, the man with the beard, I think, in the... So... Uh, Great. This is this is terrific. Um, <clears throat> your conclusion of your three parts uh, question there, but what would a Negro want with Beethoven? It just raised questions for me 
uh, at a time where we're talking so much about white supremacy, so much about white exceptionalism, so much about deconstructing the Western canon, uh, which is certainly in all areas of art, I'm just curious, how does this um, question work out in your book? What would a Negro want with Beethoven? Right, right. Yeah. That's great. No, thanks. And so that it's um, if it helps, it's taken from that that line is taken from uh, what you can read in the conclusion. It's taken from a film in 1962 um, called Gottes zweite Gottes zweite Tour, which I I forget the name in English. God's second string. I think something that's a terrible translation. Um, but and it's a film from 1962 that's kind of like the German version of Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Right, um, in which a uh, like a young white German girl falls in love with an African American GI stationed in West Germany, um, and when the family first meets him, they didn't know that he was black, so they were going to give him a Beethoven recording, being like, "This represents the best of us. This represents the best of German society." And then they find out that he's black, and they all go to the kitchen. They're like, "What do we do? Um, do we can't give this to him anymore. What would a Negro want with Beethoven?" So that's sort of the the like the the context for that. If that helps, um, you know. And so, the, to answer that question, or to think about it in a couple different ways, you know, at least within the context of my book in the 19th and 20th centuries, that there is a way that playing, and this is very much the first chapter, if this is helpful as well, that like playing Beethoven or playing these different German composers in particular did allow for African Americans to imagine a life for themselves outside of the United States. Right, and that was really freeing and liberating that they could imagine with the help of, I mean, I didn't even get into this part yet, you know, that they're all being trained by German teachers. Like, this is also the first chapter of my book. It is crazy how many German teachers are teaching African American students in particular in the 19th and 20th centuries. The names abound. Scott Joplin had yes. two, you know, like that's an example, mm -hmm. right? Like Scott, I mean, I kept a list of dozens and dozens of opera singers, violinists, etc. you know, who were taught by German teachers. And um, oh, one of my favorite facts is Nina Simone, uh, the, the, the pianist, is a direct musical descendant of Clara Schumann, which is like wild when you think about that, right? And why um, don't we know this? Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, she... yeah, yeah. Because her teacher was like Karl Friedberg, I think, who himself had studied with Clara Schumann, you know. And so I kept this list of like different people who had taught, you know, and this just kept popping up over and over again. But one of the things I'm, I'm showing in the book, or I'm hopefully showing, is that in a lot of ways, at the encouragement of their German immigrant teachers, many of whom are German Jewish in particular, I should also say, that there's a way that they, they come to think of classical music, Beethoven and the like, as a way to maybe escape the United States, right? As a way to imagine themselves as belonging to a greater world, a greater community, a greater universe that goes beyond or simply only what they know you know, in the United States. So, so I, in terms of motivation, if this is helpful, right? You know, I think that's a, a really strong driver for a lot of black classical musicians in the 19th and 20th centuries who use their studies of, you know, uh, different composers as a way to launch their careers and to finally leave the States for the first time. Um, I think there's something else I wanna say here about this question of like, you know, I feel like what's maybe haunting or lurking is a question of like, should black people do this music today or whatever? And I've gotten that question before. I remember getting it in Vienna once years ago, you know, and somebody is saying like, I, you know, a white Viennese woman being like, I think black people should stick to jazz or something. And me being like, I think black people should do whatever they want, right? Like that's sort of like, my, and I think that's still my answer. I think that's the liberating thing, right? It's like having the freedom to pursue whatever you want is the goal, I feel like, still. Thank you for asking that question and for explaining it because I didn't know of the Guess Who's Coming to Dinner version that that is the, the, the direct quote from. But I do know in American context would, you know, how there's this thought that has gotten a lot of attention, you know, was Beethoven black? And so, which as far as I know has really been, like, that's not, he wasn't black. <laughs> But um, but so it's like that resonates on a couple of different ways. Other questions? Oh, of course we. Great. And then there's somebody over here too. Oh, good. 
I was wondering if your research revealed anything about the compensation of these black opera singers, classical um, musicians. Were they paid at the same level as their white counterparts? Yeah. Right, thank you, that's a really great question. That's an excellent question. I think it definitely depends on the decade, but this was the other reason why Europe was attractive, was because they could get paid um, better. I mean, so the example I give uh, is, uh, you know, and I should say, again, there's a way that we want to recognize that, like, a lot of Americans felt like they had to establish themselves first in Europe before coming back to the States, but especially African Americans felt like if they were going to try to crash through any doors in the United States, they first had to go to Europe, right? That there's a way that they're saying, they recognize if, like, white Americans won't hear them, like, Euro not only will Europeans hear them, but coming back with European endorsements can open doors in a way that like, white Americans can no longer deny their talent, or they can no longer deny what they're doing. Um, and so there's a way that the goal is to become, the goal is to become <laughs> you know, very wealthy and to really have successful careers. So the example I give, and I have an image of him somewhere in here, again, for, forgive the, the constant scrolling, is, where is it? Um, no, let me go back, I'm gonna go back, oh, okay. Is Roland Hayes, who is a tenor in, um, ba ba ba. no, no, okay, ignore all of this stuff. Okay, there we go, okay. Roland, these are great examples, both of them. So Roland Hayes is a tenor who goes to Europe in the 1920s and comes back, I mean, not only an international superstar, um, but making, like an obscene amount of money. So in 1924, the New York Times reports that he is making over $100,000 a year in 1924, right? This is also the reason why we have so few recordings of him, because he didn't feel the need to record. He was like, man, I'm doing good enough, like performing oh, wow. concerts. I don't need to actually record that much. You know, so, um, so in terms of compensation, there are a couple different ways to think about it. One, if you could become an international superstar, you know, start off in Europe, make a big splash, uh, I mean, Roland Hayes, and this is, I forget what chapter of my book, I have letters between him and his agent, right, being like, let's up the fee, let's up the fee again, let's up the fee again. You know, so there's that going on. But then for the opera route in particular, there's also something really satisfying and comforting about the stability of opera contracts, of joining the cast and the ensemble, and knowing you have guaranteed money, you know, in that way. So either way, it feels like, and I think they're right, that there's a way that the guessing game is being taken out of, you know, of like, will I be able to survive and make a career for myself in this way? Yeah, great question. Yeah. Thank you so much, Olaf. This is so exciting. And um, I don't remember, I think it was chapter five. I have like a question when you talked about opera. And um, you mentioned a lot of these exoticized characters, right? Or Aida or somebody. How is it different than the leader tradition? Is there, um, yeah, what's the difference? Basically, can you talk a little bit about chapter five, how it is different? What's the access point there? And is there a similar backlash? Like when, oh, we put the black people into like, oh, Aida or some, like the witch or something, but how is it? with the leader tradition. Yeah, so, so in some ways it's a question like how are, how are they understood as different when they're doing Aida versus like Mozart? Is that the... Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Did um, you... By the way, it's almost like, oh, you know, we can put that singer in that, you know, we can type um, typecast a person. But um, is there a similar backlash with the leader or is it different? Um, oh. With Lita, yeah. with, okay, with Lita in particular. Yeah, this is what I love about, uh, you know, uh, this is what I love about singing German Lieder in particular is that, which is, this is no shade on opera, which I adore. You know, opera requires costumes, a set, the sort of, there's a visuality to opera that with Lita, the, the idea is that without this costume or the set that they really can be chameleons mm. in the way that they couldn't be you know, being constricted or restrained by, you know, choreography, stage directions, you know, costume, lighting, you know, set design, all of that. Um, and that also by the 1920s, not to geek out too much, but by the 1920s, you know, there's a way that there had become a sense of what a standard concert 
program was supposed to look like for all different singers, British singers, American singers, um, singers from within Europe, you know, that you were supposed to start off with Bach and Handel, right? And then move to uh, maybe some Mozart or Schubert, or, Mo you know, like maybe a Mozart aria, Schubert, and then Brahms, Wolf, etc., and then, you know, um, and then end with something from your country, like Finnish songs or like, you know, and so, and then with African Americans, with both Roland Hayes and Marian Anderson, they put African American spirituals right at the end of their concert programs. And this is what helps to sort of can canonize and institutionalize African American American art song at the end of programs. So, so there is a way that with with Lira in particular, I think for both Roland Hayes and Marian Anderson, it allowed them to be chameleons on stage. Well, the other thing I should say though is that they are also gravitating towards uh, German Lira and towards um, concert recitals because they can't get into opera houses, right? So then this is what they have to do is perform, you know, try to perform in these other ways because opera houses will not hire them. Yeah. So there is that sort of unspoken element that opera houses were segregated spaces. Um, there are exceptions that history is still being revealed and written, but a general rule of thumb, at least what I'm going by now is 1955 when Marian Anderson sang at the Met, that's when things began to open up. And in Europe, it was part of it with Grace Bumbry. Yeah, but it even was a little before. There were, I mean, a really wonderful part of this history too, though, is that here in the US, there were some all black opera companies. The two most famous are the Theodore Drury Company, which was from like 1900, pretty consistently through 1907, and then more sporadically until 1938. And then in the 50s, we have Mary Caldwell Dawson had the National Negro Opera Company. Um, so, and there's an opera called The Passion of Mary Dawson that Denise Graves has um, performed. Carlos Simon wrote the um, music and Sandra Seton has, uh, wrote the libretto. That's been at Glimmer Glass and it's going to national, Washington National Opera. There was a question down here. Right. Um, Dr. Andre, Dr. Thurman, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, I want to ask you about one particular year in German history and that year is the year 2022. <laughs> um, Germany is working to be a multicultural, moderate setter for Europe, uh, and yet it's also a place where today you can find um, white neo-Nazi movements, you can find anti-black immigrant movements. Many of the things that we see in the United States are echoing in Germany. Would you encourage a black American opera singer today from America to study in Germany or to sing in Germany? And what might they experience there that would be similar to or different from what they would experience here? That's a really great Thank question. You. Yeah. Um, you're obviously somebody who like, knows Germany. Uh, were you gonna say something, Naomi? I can jump in, right? Um, one thing for, and I know there's like a variety of knowledge bases and experiences in this room, but a, a basic difference in Germany versus um, the United States is that there are houses that are federally funded. And so there's a nice world of opera houses and house singers are paid. It's just a very different system here than the US. I know that there are some African American singers who have gone to Germany and have stayed there. They've gotten contracts and they have health insurance during the pandemic. They were paid, um, whereas here in the US it was just really difficult. And I know that many opera companies, including Seattle Opera, really tried to either honor the contracts when they could with um, the uh, operas that were put on videos or trying to hire them back. But in Germany, that wasn't even a question because of how things were subsidized. So on one hand, going to, if you can get a German contract and you can sing there, that is a great thing because there's that infrastructure. And as far as I know, it's the only country. Uh, Italy, and I've done a lot of work with um, Italian opera and Verdi. I remember going over there in the 90s and thinking, oh, I'm gonna see opera everywhere. And no, especially even now, there are fewer and fewer houses. So Germany, my understanding, it's a great place for, in a lot for of ways, opera. a great place for opera singers. Right. And in terms play. of, um, acceptance and cultural confrontations around race, 
my, I don't know, uh, actually I, real, I was just speaking with um, Ronnie Wade, is that his name? Wade, the singer, black singer. Um, he had trained at Michigan through Louise Toppin. We were talking with him on a Zoom for another project I'm working on where people are going over to Germany, gosh, in the beginning of November. And he was saying, you know, he's one of these people who stayed there, who loves it, who said that in terms of race issues, he's much more nervous when he comes back to the United States. And he grew up here. And he says when he gets back to Germany, home, he's been there, I think, since the 90s, he's just said, you know, I have a, a sigh of relief. I'm here, you know, like, and it's all right. Yeah, the United States is um, not necessarily a really safe place for a lot of folks, given sort of the predominance of gun violence we hear, and it's not a, a really great space for a lot of black folks where there's a lot of other violence going on. I mean, yeah, but uh, then I'm going to also say Germany's not great either, right? I mean, so that's also where... Okay, tell me you know, more I about this. I think there this. is no pot of gold at the end of any rainbow, And you right? spent um, time in Germany, you know. Well, yeah, right, so I mean, so I... I would say there's a really great essay by Gary Young, Y-O-U-N-G-E, on Black Europe in the New York Review of Books, where he basically kind of makes this argument that like there is no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for, you know, like in terms of which country is going to be better. It's just a matter of they're different, you know? Um, and is if, he speaking, uh, so he's speaking about a black population over there. No, I mean, just, just I think re regardless, yeah. like of just, you know, of, of if you're moving from one country to the other, he's black British, he lived in the States for a long time, went back to the UK, you know, um, and, and let, has, his wife is from Chicago, she's African American, you know, and they have this conversation all the time. I have this conversation with a lot of African Americans all the time as well, African Americans who study in Germany, who study German you know, German history or black German history or black German studies, you know, um, that there's no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and that um, the, the, I mean, if I were to talk to an African American opera singer who's like, I got a, you know, I've got a gig in Germany, I would ask where mm -hmm. is the first question, right? Um, yeah. That some places are better than others. Some places are safer than others. Um, you know, I have a rule of, I don't, I, if I can avoid it, I don't go to East Germany for example, right? Um, my sister lived in Dresden for years and it was a nightmare. Like I have all kinds of stories, you know? So, so I think that um, being aware, but then other places, are, other places are different, right? So, but I think having the, the context to be able to, to know enough about different German regions, locations, et cetera, uh, helps as well as I think for me, when I go to different parts in Germany, Connecting to different Afro-German communities is also what is so great and what makes it so wonderful and rewarding. So, um, you know, and it can come from anywhere. Like, of course, Berlin is like a big center with a lot of really great Afro-German uh, cultural institutions. There's Each One Teach One is called, which is also a library and like a youth center. There's Ballhaus Nanninstrasse, which is like a, an, like a theater that does lots of Afro-German theatrical stuff and plays, you know, so there's stuff like that, but then like I was randomly in Stuttgart and like got connected with like a sort of Afro-German network and had a great time. Like it just, it really can kind of, mm. so that's the other piece of advice maybe is like if you're going to do it, make these other kinds of connections um, because that's what's going to also be so wonderful and so lovely while you're also enjoying going to the opera and singing and performing. Uh, oh. Let's see, we got one way up there. So just as a follow-up to some of the earlier uh, considerations here, um, I wonder if you could just say a little bit about some generation, um, generational um, perspectives on this. Um, we talked beforehand in the reception about the Zoomer Boomer polarization. Um, so I'm just curious what you found uh, when I was just describing before of the uh, 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 of the de-emphasizing um, of the Western Canada canon, much of which is uh, is white, and much of uh, no small part of which is German. What are you finding in that area? Again, related to the previous question, is what interest is there in um, the black community's um, 
approach to this Western canon of music from a generational perspective, i.e. Zoomers versus boomers, or in between? I mean, I could say a couple of different things, thinking as a historian who, I mean, my research mostly stops in the 1960s, you know, which is to say that if we're looking at, for example, the 1920s and 1930s, uh, which is, of course, a very different time in a lot of ways, yeah, that there's, that there is, I mean, so this is, and actually this is kind of my next project, so thank you for bringing this up, is that I am interested in this question of um, something like, is, is there something like a golden age, you know, of, of sort of black engagements with classical music, which I see really in particularly from the 1920s through the 1940s, mm. um, where you see, for example, um, oh my gosh, one of my favorite things that I learned was like a um, uh, community in Baltimore putting on like Tannhäuser in 1921, like an African American, we made up of like high school students, college students, and the like, right? Um, doing this. Um, Shirley Graham Du Bois, of course, was inspired by Wagner. If we're just thinking, of, there are so many different people inspired by by Wagner, in particular Harry Lawrence Freeman, the African American composer. Um, during the Harlem Renaissance, um, also wrote um, so many operas. You know, thinking about like how to use light motifs and things like that. Uh, at the time, he was called the Black Wagner. The Colored yeah. Wagner was one of his was one of his titles that he he used for himself as well. Um, but I think you're right. The thing that's really interesting to me is that not only is there something like a golden age, if we want to call it that, or a rise of something like an interest in you know, performing classical music. I am also interested in black criticisms of classical mm -hmm. music. And when do we see those emerge, mm -hmm. right? And so when do we see like African-Americans be like, what if this music is not for us? I think we can have that conversation as well. You know, and that for me at least, one of the first iterations I see of that is in 1934 with Langston Hughes. Um, and one of his short stories, I've written about this in a piece called um, Singing Against the Grain, if you're interested in it. It should be free online in a magazine called The Point, uh, Singing Against the Grain, where he, he kind of starts wondering and questioning if this music is simply just white people's music and that we play it at our peril. You know, and so what he has in this short story is an African-American violinist who's actually just come back from Germany and Austria, um, who ends up being killed by a white supremacist mob, you know, even though this is the most respectable person, you know, and who who is just, you know, recently performed like a Brahms violin piece. And, and in some ways the message if, okay, so maybe if we're thinking about a rise and fall, and forgive me for being like a historian and thinking in terms of historical narratives here, but if we're thinking about something like a rise and fall, I can see this narrative of, you know, throughout the 19th century and then into the 20th century, the narrative being one of the narratives, not the only one, but one of the narratives being that classical music could function as a form of racial uplift and that it could be tied to the po like, to respectability politics. Like this is what can make us presentable in the eyes of society. This is how we can get white Americans to treat us better and to not be hostile towards us, right? To not be violent towards us is if we, you know, this whole thing of like whistling Vivaldi, right? This idea of like, maybe this is our way to something like safety and freedom is by a quote unquote cultural assimilation. It's by performing a certain kind of respectability, you know, and then Langston Hughes by 1935 with this piece um, you know, 1934, I should say, where this classical violinist, a black classical violinist, is killed by a white mob. I mean, he really does, I think, come to argue pretty forcefully that, like, classical music will not save black people from white supremacy, right? Like, it will not save us, right? And so if you're expecting it to do that, um, look elsewhere. I mean, so there is, I think there are more and more critiques going on, but I would like, this is me wanting to do this kind of work in the future is like, you know, can't, like how do we talk about black engagements with classical music and also black ambivalence towards classical music? I think you're right to also point that out. That's a long-winded answer. I, I have a few other pieces, sort of other narratives to weave in there. 
One, which I, I, I didn't know about this 1934 essay, and that's really interesting, sort of what's happening inside the black community and talking about this. I feel there are still so many stories we don't know of black music that's out there. I remember um, the BBC Music Magazine asked me to write a piece um, honoring the, commemorating the one year anniversary of Jesse Norman's passing. And I thought, okay, I'm going to, either biographies and stuff like that out there, but I really wanna get a sense of Jesse Norman not being discovered by white folks, and wow, look, she can sing opera, but just sort of that world that really helped nurture her. And I found, I was going into all these different interviews, and she said that one thing her family did at Christmas is that they did performances of um, parts of Handel's Messiah, where one of, I think one of her brothers played the trumpet, someone played the piano, they were all singing. And so they were doing this in their home. And there's a whole world, if black folks were, uh, concert venues were segregated to black folks, guess what, they're doing it in churches. They're doing it in, um, in their homes, they're having different groups. So my sense is that, sort of to get to this larger issue, there's this world of black folks, particularly in the United States, who are making classical music. When we think of classical music today, we still think of it as being connected to white communities, and yet nobody is close to Beethoven or Mozart. I mean, that's really far in the past and distanced from all of us. And if we want to take maybe a positive sense that music is, again, being keeping the scare quotes of universal, that it can talk, but it can speak to people today. We're all equally far away from where it first happened in a lot of ways. You know, there are many generations. So the fact, I feel that we're uncovering these sort of histories of this long-term black families performing music, communities, things like that. So yeah. no, I think both of them exist. Right. Yeah. I mean, just to piggyback off of that, I mean, I think this is what I was thinking about with this quote unquote golden age, so to speak, that the irony yeah. is that it's happening under segregation, right? And that what it means is that there are whole black communities who can like create and maintain and sustain uh, orchestras, opera houses. Uh, right. There are so many like Negro string quartets, yes. Negro orchestras, right, that right. got created in the 19 teens, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, you know, and that without a single white person in the audience, they're not interested in playing for white people. It's not about white people. Right. Right. I'm, it's about what they want to do for themselves because they like it and they want to play it. Right. That yeah. there's really a falling in love with this music. That right. it's something, and maybe it's it's a sense of yes, a respectability politics is part of it. It's part of it, but well, it's kind but it's of not this the only thing. Right, it's not the only thing. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe questions. the other thing also maybe along those lines is like, I mean, this is what I mean about like, again, when that lady, when that like white Austrian lady was like, I think black people should do jazz. And I said, I think black people should do whatever they want, you know, but, but there is a certain kind of like power, aesthetic yeah. power in being like, this brings me aesthetic joy. So I'm just going to do it. Yes. Right. And, and like be like the, the, the the um, insistence on doing this because it brings you joy and for no other reason is right. fascinating and liberating and kind of radical sometimes as well. Be like, I like it. I just want to do it. I like uh, it. Absolutely. And I'll take it one step further or sort of stretch it in this way that if we think these are the treasures that are available to everyone, then everyone, everyone who's a human can participate in these things. And I'm not trying to say that Bach and this German tradition is more human. Spoken word, hip hop, jazz, that's also, you know, it, we've got a lot of white folks who do those things. And that's a great thing in that it shows that this is music that can speak to everybody. So there's sort of an element of an aesthetic beauty and, and joy that's part of it. Ah, question over here. Thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed the whole talk and conversation. It's lovely to hear. I was wondering, um, in the German uh, reception of all these black singers, how much um, 
Americanness is being conflated with blackness, mm. yeah. or how are mm. audiences mm. seeing those things as separate That's a really or together? Great question. I mean, the funny thing is, I actually haven't talked that much about German reception of them. You know, so that's a really great question. And they, oh, it's so complicated. It's so complicated. You know, that on the one hand, um, I would say by the 1920s, there isn't a better understanding of American blackness that they can use to uh, understand. Marian Anderson and to be and and so there's an expectation by the 1920s certainly that uh, like oh you're not doing jazz like what is what are you doing I don't understand I thought black people did jazz why are you singing this Mozart thing you know so although she didn't sing Mozart really but um, you know so so by the 1920s there's an understanding of an American blackness I guess I would say um, but at the same time over and over again, there's a really fascinating flattening of blackness, of, of not knowing, like especially in the 19th century, what I find so fascinating is not understanding that black people can be from America um, and thinking that they could only be from Africa. And then you have to do this thing of, of them saying, you know, of like, no, I'm from, I'm, and I should say as well, like this is really complicated, but I, this is something I experienced my whole life of like people being like, I remember being eight years old in Vienna. I still remember this and like at a zoo and like this old Oma, this old like, you know, white Austrian lady being like, do you miss Kenya? And then being like, I'm not from Kenya, I'm from America. And she was like, that's impossible. And then I had to like name African Americans, which were, like at the time was like Michael Jordan. Oh my gosh. You know, uh, and who else did I name? And then, of course the entire time we were speaking in German, like wir, wir reden die ganze Zeit auf Deutsch, right? And so that's like the other kind of like irony, like added on top of all of this as well. Um, so there is this really fascinating kind of like flattening of identities of like not understanding how like a black diaspora and black migration works. Um, you know, but what we didn't get into, which we don't have that much time to get into, but you know, the thing I found so fascinating was in listening to and reading through German criticisms of black musicians, especially for opera, the ways that they would say that a singer sounded like smoky mm. and like dark. And I'm like, this is very greased, right? Like, this is somebody who's like high soprano, Mozart light soprano, and they're like, ooh, smoky. And I'm like, really? Are you sure? Like, I don't think that's what's going on, yeah. you know? Um, so, so that was really fascinating, was realizing how they're trying to find ways to like listen to race in the mm. performance itself or listen to blackness in the performance, even though like because of like the nature of operatic training, et cetera, et cetera, like that's not supposed to be what's happening in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really? I think Naomi, oh, is this oh. on Terry? Uh, we might have time for just one more very quick question. Sure. It's on? Okay, yes. so, yeah. so thanks so much for this uh, wonderful event. Uh, one of the things that's so, uh, I think, nice about the book is that it is a performer-centered history, right? So often in music history, we um, focus on composers and works and forget about the people who make the music and, and sing and play. Um, and uh, I can't help but want to ask what the prospects of black composers were like in Germany, however, right? I mean, you mentioned Lohan Hayes' uh, spirituals, which were, I mean, of, of course he was doing some composition of that kind of thing, but I, I'm wondering what the broader story uh, is there. Was Germany an attractive prospect for black composers and what particular challenges and possibilities might have been present there for composition? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I don't do much with composers because for a variety of reasons, I found it more interesting to think about, again, how black people were performing, like a certain kind of Germanness on stage that then German audiences are like constantly wigging out about. Um, you know, so that was more important to me to do that. Um, you know, and also this is the radical idea that Christopher Small proposes is like there is no such thing as like the musical work object, which like leads musicologists to get into fights, but like that's a whole other thing. Um, you know, but I would say that like, yes, of course there are examples of black 
European composers. There are examples I stumbled across, um, like um, uh, Hans van Eigerhuber is his name, who was, he's considered the grandfather of Haitian art music, like one of the first people to compose um, art music um, about Haiti using Haitian rhythms and melodies and all of that. And he is the son of somebody who was uh, Creole and I think also white German, grew up in Haiti, came to Germany, ironically, in 1915 during World War I because the United States had just invaded Haiti. So he had to flee there and come to Germany and lived in Germany until 1937 under the Nazis when he's forced to flee because of Nazi racial oh laws, right? And that, um, but you know, so he's this really interesting figure who is black German, who is Afro, who, who we would consider Afro-German, his main language was German, but he's definitely also pivotal for creating like the body of art music that we now have that's supposed to sort of represent Haiti that goes back to the 1920s and 30s. So there are some really interesting figures like that, if interested. I, it's a great question. Yeah, because, you're the one who knows. You would, oh, you'd be well, the one who like, it's no. a great question because we don't know a lot of black composers who are brought. I think singers are easier on one level to trace because they're giving concerts that are performed and they go to different places and you can get funding to bring them over. Who's going to bring in the 20s? Or the, I mean, it was hard enough for Roland Hayes and Marian Anderson to get funding, but who's going to bring a black person to write art music. Yeah, I mean, that was still, it, it's, they must have been there, and these few examples we have, but there is almost no trace. My understanding, and again, if you know of this, please let me know, because we're writing this history, but it's the African-American black composers where we begin to find some stuff. It's not published a lot of times, or in the rare case of William Grant Still, you have his daughter, um, Judith Still, who is indefatigable in trying to get his music out there. But it's a great question, what would that look like with somebody, since we know there are Afro-Germans, what would a musical sound look like? There must be. I just don't know, it's a great question. Oh my goodness, unfortunately, I think we are at this point where I just wanna thank you for being here. We're at that point where we need to sort of close up our conversation, but it will continue with, um, at the solo bar, is that? And a book signing. Uh, oh, We're and there's a the book signing, signing. yes, this signing. is happening, yeah, we please. We're gonna do that first. Thank you, thank you, my dear friend, no, colleague, you, for being you. here. Yay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so please continue. We'll be up here, I think, um, if, if you need a signature on a book. <laughs>